the Orthodox Church by 1987 had only three seminaries. One in Moscow, one in Leningrad, one in Petersburg. Uh, one, in, one in Odessa, in Ukraine. Two in Russia, one in Ukraine. In these three seminaries, 60 to 65 percent of the seminarians came from the territory that was Greek Catholic before the war. Imagine the Soviet Union, you know, the size, the size of this uh, curtain. Ukraine would be the size a little smaller than the piano in that corner of the curtain. Now the Greek Catholic side would be one quarter of the piano, just a little corner. Two thirds of the Orthodox seminarians for the whole Soviet Union were from this traditionally Greek Catholic territory. Another little factoid. We've got this map here, imaginary map, and we've got our piano, which is the size of Ukraine. One half of the Orthodox parishes in the entire Soviet Union were in Ukraine. And one half of the parishes in, that were in Ukraine were in the small part that was Western Ukraine. So when all of a sudden, in 89, these parishes said, we are Catholic again, the Russian Orthodox Church lost 20, at least 20% of its parishes. Like that. It lost the territory where it, was, it had 60% of its seminarians coming from. And those parishes were frequented by, by pious people. And what do pious people do when they go to church? They give money. So more than 25% of the budget of the Russian Orthodox Church was coming from the Greek Catholic area. And you will read time and time again from Russian Orthodox sources that the Greek Catholics devastated us in Western Ukraine. How? They exercised their freedom to be themselves and no longer be under that yoke. The church emerges from the underground. There's great euphoria. There's great need. Remember, there were 2,500 priests serving this community before the war. They were reduced in 50 years down to 300. This number is uh, reinforced by 700 priests that pass from the Orthodox Church, but are, who are from Greek Catholic families. In the 1990s, my arch eparchy, archdiocese, in one decade, ordained 700 priests. In 20 years, the church is back up to 2,500 priests. And the number is growing by 100 per year. For 5 million faithful, the Eastern Catholics are about 10% of the population. For, 500, uh, for 5 million faithful, Today we have 800 seminarians. I don't know what the statistics are in the U.S. Uh, there's a little more than 800 seminarians probably in the U.S., but there's 40 million or 50 million uh, Catholics. Another very important factor in the history of the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine is that it had singular leadership for more than a century. From 1901 to 1944, the head of the church was 
Metropolitan Andrew Shiptitsky, who was a mystic who translated St. Basil and Plato from Greek into Ukrainian, who was the founder of monasteries, hospitals, museums. His wealth was, uh, you know, he was a billionaire basically, in, in the terms that, if you compare it to today's time. He was a count. They spoke French at home. And his family, a hundred years before his birth, left the Eastern Catholic Church and became Polonized and members of the Latin Church because being Eastern Catholic was second class. He made a personal decision, or he felt the vocation, to return to the roots of his family. There had been even bishops from his family in the Eastern Catholic Church. His father went bananas. Uh, all of Polish society uh, was a buzz. Um, when Pope Benedict XV became personally involved, and personally, this young man received the blessing to pursue monastic life in the Eastern Catholic Church. At the age of 35, the Holy See appointed him head of this church. And guess who was upset? The Ukrainians. Because they thought, this is it. They've sent in this Polish Trojan horse. <laughs> He's from this Polish family. His brother is a general in the Polish army. And it took a long time uh, for him to be accepted. When he came to Chicago to immigrants in the 1920s, Ukrainian immigrants threw tomatoes at him. Uh, it's a complex story, but it was 44 years of incredible visionary uh, leadership. He worked on Ukrainian and Polish recon uh, reconciliation, was, which was an issue that cut through his family. His brother followed his example and became an Eastern Catholic monk and was martyred and is already beatified. The cause of Metropolitan Shiptitsky is well advanced. And John Paul II, when he came to Ukraine, said, we, we quoted him seven times in 11 sermons, and said we, we're, we're hoping for his beatification, that the process ends soon. But it's a very complicated process, because in 44 years of pastoral life, he also wrote a lot. And these archives are not only now being opened and studied, and it's going to take, it's, it's taking quite a while. He was given by the Pope special powers to choose his own successor, which he did in 1939 after the war broke up. And his choice was Joseph Sleepy, who was rector of the New Theological Academy the school that our university grew out of. In fact, there are already eight beatified faculty members or students from this school, beatified as martyrs by John Paul II in 2001 when he came to Ukraine for a tremendous visit. Joseph Slipe, took over in November 1944 when Metropolitan Shiptitsky died. And five months later came April the 11th and his arrest, along with the rest of the hierarchy. And he spent 18 years in the Gulag. In 1963, after the Cuban Missile Crisis of the fall of 1962, when at the same time the first Vatican, session of Vatican I was occurring. He was released at the request of Pope John XXIII, who had intervened to calm down tensions between the Soviet Union and uh, the US regarding this crisis. 
that brought the world to the verge of a nuclear war. John Paul III, uh, John, John the XXIII, asked for Joseph uh, C.P.'s release, and Khrushchev said, is that guy still alive? I was responsible for putting him in prison in 1945, because Khrushchev was in charge of the party in Ukraine. They released him. He was 71 years old, crippled by frostbite. And the Soviets were convinced that he would live out his life quietly in some Roman monastery. He had to promise not to you know, make too much noise, not to embarrass the Soviets. But he curled up his sleeves and got to work. Within eight years in Rome, he declared the creation of the Ukrainian Catholic University, something the Austrian, Polish, Soviet, and Nazi authorities did not allow. I was a young man in, 80, in 68, young man. I was seven years old <laughs> when he came to Syracuse, uh, New York. And I was chosen uh, to greet him at the airport. And that was the first of the encounters that changed the direction of my life. Because as a teenager, I met him a few more times. And he was traveling the world in his late 80s, telling members of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, the church is alive. Your brothers and sisters are rendering unto the Lord a singular witness, unto blood. And we need to stay with them. And the Soviet system will not last forever. We need to prepare for the change. And some of us, and Father Taras was one was, one, was the first student that went to the seminary in Rome. Some of us were too young not to believe. And so I went from Syracuse to Rome and became a seminarian for Ukraine, incarnated in his diocese, because he was the bishop in exile. Conveniently, a few years later, Perestroika occurred with Gorbachev and the Soviet Union peacefully fell apart. And I was invited, uh, after completing a doctorate, I was still laying to work on this university project. And Cardinal C.P.'s successor, Cardinal Lubachewski, at that point said, you know, I can't give you money, there's no land, there's no building, there are no books, there's no program, but we need a university uh, level theology faculty, which then should become the cornerstone of a university. So we began from scratch for two years carefully planning, really asking the question in a postmodern culture, in a post Soviet profoundly traumatized society that is multi-ethnic, polyconfessional. What kind of university does Ukraine and the post-Soviet Union need? And we began building slowly. The annual budget the first year was around $100,000. Today, uh, 16 years later, the annual budget is still microscopic. Although there's 300 people that work at the university, 150 faculty, 100 of whom are full-time. We've got uh, a theology faculty, a humanities faculty, a business school, uh, a school of religious education, an iconography school, programs in sacred music, uh, in January beginning a journalism school, we're planning a school of uh, social sciences, psychology, sociology, and political science, and we're looking forward to opening also a law school. All of this we hope will, will occur in the next five to seven years. We have 600 students, 
full time. And 800 students in various uh, non-degree certificate uh, programs. The city of Lviv is like San Francisco or Boston. It is a university town. 850,000 people live there, but 140,000 students with 22 institutions of higher learning. We are really 1% of that student body. But in many of the questions of charity, of social need, of political propriety, also intellectual questions, uh, the university generates between 30 and 40 percent of the university discourse in the city. Today there's 170 universities in Ukraine, but there's only one Catholic university in Ukraine, and there's actually only one Catholic university for the 12 time zones of the former Soviet Union. Out of those 12, uh, 170 universities, only two or three or maybe are completely free of corruption, which is the main cancer plaguing Ukrainian society. And only two universities stand for academic freedom and do not kowtow to the authorities. Our persecution today is really not a persecution, there's pressure, there's a lot of tension. I was just diagnosed with a pre-ulceral condition last week. Um, but we walk forward with a smile. This is not the persecution that our forefathers went through, our mothers and fathers in the faith. Uh, we live in a time of growth of the church. The church is alive. Uh, the Eastern Catholic Church in Ukraine is the biggest segment of civil society that is free and speaks on various topics and does so from a Christian gospel-based perspective. I uh, mentioned the annual budget uh, in 1994. Today for 300 people and for all the new books, uh, for all of the expenses of running all of the different schools, the budget is $2.2 million annually, of which 1% is provided by the local church through an annual collection. Thousands of people, tens of thousands, contribute. It's the widow's might, which we're very grateful for. The average salary in Ukraine is depending on where one lives, between $200 and $300 a month. But the cost of meat in Ukraine is equal to the cost of meat in Virginia. Uh, an automobile costs like an automobile in Virginia. A uh, mobile telephone costs more in Ukraine than it does in Virginia. Uh, so we have this dedicated group of uh, faculty who are top-notch, you know, five, six, seven languages, uh, who can be working in business where they would be earning three, four, five times as much, but they're fully dedicated to this vision of trying to find, working together to develop a language to articulately, creatively, and beautifully express the Christian faith in the 21st century. We're trying some things that uh, uh, might be precedent setting for the global context. We're not saying we need to catch up. We're saying we receive an incredible chance. Our forefathers accomplished the greatest achievement and met the hardest challenge of the 20th century. It was tough to put a man on the moon, to develop computers, to split the atom. But spiritually and humanly, the biggest challenge was to overcome totalitarianism. If they could do it then, cannot we do so in the 21st century? Cannot we come up with a way of living, a way of speaking about the gospel, 
about a way of sharing it that will be convincing, joyous, peace rendering, and morally compelling. It's a beautiful life. It's a great vocation. It's wonderful to be working with these young children, or young students. Um, our students have, are having our graduates. We have 700 graduates, 200 of them gone for studies abroad. They're having many children. Uh, our first 108 graduates have already <coughs> over 200 children, just in the last uh, few years. Some have four, five, six, six kids. There's young sisters, uh, young contemplative monks. So it's a difficult and hard history that I've shared with you, but it's also a, a beautiful history, a history of much grace. And the fact that the resurrection is a, is a reality. The Lord gives life where there, where there is the cross and where there is the faithfulness to his passion. So maybe with this kind of introduction, uh, of a broad panorama of a complicated history, uh, we could have uh, a continuation with questions and answers. <laughs>